when we look at James chapter 2, you have to go back to verse 14. You have to get context. What good is it, my brother and brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Can that faith save him? It is a said faith. It is a faith that makes claims. But then when you look for evidence of its existence, all it is is it exists in word. And we aren't saying, and this is, this is important. Well, this is important for me, but I, this is where, watch your toes, okay? Because I'm about to step on a few of them, all right? Not yours, honey. I would never step on your toes. I would never do that. But um, I'm going to step on some other toes. If you don't believe, if, if in the first written debate of the Reformation, which was between Martin Luther and the Dutch humanist scholar, Roman Catholic priest, Desiderius Erasmus. Now, Erasmus was a great guy. I'm thinking we're going to see Erasmus in heaven. But he was very much still a part of that mindset. You know what the first debate of the Reformation was on? The freedom of the will. Uh, Erasmus defended the freedom of the will. Luther defended the bondage of the will. And from that came the emphasis, which is found in Scripture, that saving faith is the work of the Spirit of God in his elect people. So the faith that saves is a supernatural faith. The, the faith that saves is the work of the Spirit of God who raises us to spiritual life and in the words of the Old Testament prophet, takes out the heart of stone and what? Gives you a heart of flesh. Ezekiel, Jeremiah. That picture is used more than once. And by the way, there has never been a stony heart that wanted to be taken out. That is a radical action of grace by God to raise us to spiritual life, take out that heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. So the faith that saves is a spirit-born faith. And the reason it perseveres is because Christ said that I have come down of heaven, not to my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me that of all that he's given me, I lose none of them, but raise them up on the last day. If you don't believe that God can save perfectly in of himself, you don't believe what Jesus said in John 6, 39. You just don't. If you have a synergistic position, it doesn't matter whether you're Church of Christ or a Southern Baptist. If you have a synergistic view you are standing on the other side of the Tiber River arguing against Martin Luther, and I would say you're arguing against the Apostle Paul. And so when we talk about James chapter 2, when he says, can that faith save him, we say, nope. Because it's a said faith. It has no reality to it. It's not the result of the supernatural work of the Spirit of God in a person's life. And so as far as I know, the only people who can give a balanced understanding of Romans 5, justified by faith, peace with God. Romans 8, we have a mediator that stands in the presence of the Father, and therefore no one can bring a charge against us. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? If Christ is standing in the presence of the Father in my place, who can make a charge stick against me when Jesus says, I've paid it all? No one. No one. But if you don't believe that Christ has a special people, if you don't believe that a special people, not because of anything in them, but because of God's mercy has been given by the Father to the Son, and the Father says to the Son, you will be their perfect Savior. My will for you is that you save every last one of them. That means Jesus has to be a perfect Savior. He has to have the capacity and ability in and of himself to save perfectly. That's the Savior I need because I'm going to tell you something. If it's a cooperative effort between me and Jesus and he's dependent upon me, I'm doomed 
and so are you.